You're listening to the podcast of The Branch in Ashland, Virginia. All of us are emotional creatures. Some of us have been taught to just go with whichever emotion we're feeling at the moment. Others of us have been taught not to trust them and maybe even to stuff them down, ignore them, because it's not right for us to have them in the first place. David, the shepherd boy, poet, king, and warrior, was a man who understood emotions, and he was honest about them. As we look at some of his words today, we consider how we live our lives with emotional margin, moving towards emotional maturity and health. We as human beings have a love-hate relationship with emotions. Um... (laughs) Those of us who have the strength of empathy, see if I can speak my words this morning, may have a hard time distinguishing between where our emotions start and someone else's stop. We may feel sometimes like our emotions can cloud our judgment even when we have to make decisions in our lives. Um, Some of us might struggle with, with depression and come to that place where where we feel like we've got to be on all the time for everybody else, and meanwhile, deep inside, we're just dying. And we feel like there's just, uh, we're barely holding on, but we've got to put on this front and this face that, hey, everything's great. You know, others of us have been taught that that's the way we're supposed to be. Put on a front, put on a face, and uh, stuff down those emotions as far as you possibly can. You know, they're not reliable. Uh, In fact, um, they're of the devil, and you need to just run away from them. They're not safe. They need to be avoided, and and doing anything less would be to acknowledge our weakness and and vulnerability. Never let them see you sweat. Definitely don't let them see the chinks in your armor and expose your, your weakness or your vulnerability that someone else might take advantage of at some point in the future. You know, if we're honest, we experience highs and lows in life. Uh, if, you, if you haven't, then congratulations. Talk to me about your secret at some point. Um, but for me, I've been there before. Um, traditionally, the fall has not been my favorite season. And so I, you know, some people are like, how is that possible? I love the fall. Oh, pumpkin spice, everything, you know. And I just, that's just, it's not me. Um, and, and I struggle. You know, I, I, if I'm honest, I've had enough happen in my own life that any time that I feel like I, I hit this, this high point in my life, I'm always looking around over my shoulder, bracing myself for what's going to kind of knock me down. And I'm almost afraid to, to rejoice and relish that moment because of what's lurking like right behind it. There's troughs and there's valleys in life. I brought my little bobblehead this morning. Someone thought it was a bobblehead of me. So um, it's like I didn't realize I was that fat, but I, I, guess, I, I guess I am. Um, this is Charles Spurgeon, see? I keep that in my office as a reminder. And um, somebody, I, I read a lot of books, which is a blessing and a curse. Um, first of all, I can never remember what I'm reading and where I read something. Uh, the other thing is that everyone recommends books to you, too. So... Thanks to my friend Sam out there, um, we are reading a book together called Spurgeon's Sorrows, which um, is about the struggle emotionally that Charles Spurgeon, who is a famous pastor, had with his own emotions. And this is what he said. He said, the mind can descend far lower than the body, for in it there are bottomless pits. The flesh can bear only a certain number of wounds and no more but the soul can bleed in 10,000 ways and die over and over again each hour. And some of you are like, I have no idea what he's talking about. And then others of you are like, oh my gosh, he read my diary. I I can't believe that uh, he can articulate something like that. C.S. Lewis, who we've talked about a lot in this series on margin, he understood the emotionality of human beings as well. And in 1963, he wrote this. He said, No natural feelings are high or low, holy or unholy in themselves. They're all holy when God's hand is on the rein. They all go bad when they set up on their own 
and make themselves into false gods. So two perspectives on emotions. And as we've been doing is throughout the series, as we've been looking at this idea of creating margin in our lives, today we talk about that idea of emotional margin. What do we do with that? And we've been looking kind of through the lens of C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters, a book that he wrote as kind of an imaginary thinking about what the exchange would be between uh, a demon in training and his seasoned and, uh, and experienced uncle. And in that, Uncle Screwtape writes to his nephew and says this. He says, humans are amphibians, half spirit and half animal. The enemy's determination to produce such a revolting hybrid was one of the things that determined our father to withdraw his support from him. Now remember, when he says our father, he's not talking about our father, he's talking about our father, right? Like the devil, okay? So as spirits, they belong to the eternal world, but as animals, they inhabit time. This means that while their spirit can be directed to an eternal object, their bodies, passions, and imaginations are in continual change. For to be in time, it means to change. Their nearest approach to constancy, therefore, is undulation. The repeated return to a level from which they repeatedly fall back, a series of troughs and peaks. If you had watched your patient carefully, you would have seen this undulation in every department of his life. His interest in his work, his affection for his friends, his physical appetites, they all go up and down. As long as he lives on earth, periods of emotional and bodily richness and liveliness will alternate with periods of numbness and poverty. The dryness and dullness through which your patient is now going are not, as you fondly suppose, your workmanship. They're merely a natural phenomenon which will do us no good unless you make good use of it. So, even again, C.S. Lewis acknowledging the fact that in life, we experience those highs and lows, those valleys and troughs as well as the mountains. And so I firmly believe that God's created us as holistic creatures. It means we're physical, we're emotional, we're intellectual, we're spiritual, and we're social. But as we consider that in our own lives, and we consider this idea of emotion today, what do we do with that? What does it look like for us to have margin in the area of emotions? What does it look like for us to actually have emotionally healthy lives? In the Bible, David was just a young man when God called him to be king. And once he was called, his life uh, was filled with all kinds of different turmoil. Right away, King Saul, who was Saul at the time, uh, began to, to... take a a major dislike to him because he knew that this was the guy who was going to take over for me. And so David um, embraced some of those emotions that he felt as he experienced this older king who wanted to kill him and would even at some point in in his life would hurl spears at him and and do everything that he could to, to basically squash him down. David understood what it meant to to have emotion and then to honestly express it. In fact, David became really good friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. And when Jonathan died, he expressed his emotion in that. In 2 Samuel 1.26, he, he said this, he said, I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. Now, you will not find many guys that would articulate that. You know, they're all like, hey, how's it going? You know, give me a fist bump, whatever. You know, but to actually acknowledge that here's some deep emotion that I feel towards a guy. And unlike, you know, what our culture might say, you know, there's, there's nothing sexual there. It's a, it's a connection between them in this emotional bond that David and Jonathan had with one another. A man who's in touch with his feelings. He was a musician. He was a a poet. He was a king and a shepherd. And it's like, I thought I was kind of schizophrenic in my interest. David makes me feel a little bit better. Because he's got all these different interests kind of put together in one. And in Psalm 6, David gives us a picture more of his honesty with these emotions. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Psalm chapter 6. And this is what we read. It's up on the screen. I'm reading in the New International Version. 
He writes this, Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord? How long? Turn, Lord, deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. Among the dead, no one proclaims your name. Who praises you from the grave? I am worn out from my groaning. All night long, I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. Away from me, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies will be overwhelmed with shame and anguish. They'll turn back and suddenly be put to shame. And David expresses his emotions in such a deep and honest way. And what can we learn from David in how he expresses these emotions? First of all, I think what we learn from David is that we need to be honest about our emotions. You know, for those of us who have been raised to say, oh, I can't trust them, I need to squash them down, don't let me feel them, or people like me who are like, that, that feels too big for me, so I don't want to touch it. Let me push it away. Instead, uh, we need to be honest about it. You know, so many of us, I think, have been taught that we need to just, you know, if it's not trustworthy, then just put it away. Hide it and forget about it. And Peter Scazzaro, who is a pastor in New York, has some great stuff about um, emotional health. Uh, one of the books that I'm quoting from today is Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. It's a, a great book that uh, he talks about this idea of, of learning how to move into that space of being healthy in our emotions. And one of the things that he says is if we aren't emotionally healthy, we can never be spiritually healthy either. And again, because we are holistic creatures and God created us as such, he, he doesn't say, hey, get physically healthy, but it's okay if your spiritual life and your emotional life are a train wreck. No, he's saying, hey, how do we move towards a place of wholeness and health in every one of the areas of our lives, because if we're not moving towards that, if we're not emotionally healthy, then we're never going to be spiritually healthy. And it's going to start manifesting itself in so many different ways in our lives. He writes in his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, Scazzaro says this, he says, it's true that some Christians live in the extreme of following their feelings in an unhealthy, unbiblical way. It's more common, however, to encounter Christians who do not believe they have permission to admit their feelings or express them openly. I mean, maybe you've been in that place before. Maybe you've been in churches. Maybe you've heard pastors who have said, hey, whatever those emotions are, like turn them aside, forget about them, you can't trust them, go away. I'm telling you right here, that's not what God calls us to. He says that we need to take them out. We need to be honest with them. Put them in front of us. And some of you may or may not be familiar with the Enneagram. Uh, it's a personality profile and um, typology that, that kind of puts people into these different categories. I'm an Enneagram 8, so the emotion that I do well is anger. And one of the things that I've really had to wrestle with over the last couple years is, does this really mean I'm angry or is it hiding something else? Because me being vulnerable means that I need to say, hey, that's not really anger. In fact, um, I just had this conversation not too long ago with one of my kids. Because anger came out and I realized that that anger was masking something else deep inside. It, it was fear. That if I was really honest and I pulled that anger out and I looked at it and I said, yeah, it doesn't really mean I'm angry. It really means that deep inside I'm scared to death. And I need to be honest with that. And you know what? It sucks. <laughs> it doesn't feel good. But once I get it out, once I say, okay, what is this? And what am I supposed to do with this? Then I have to ask myself, like, is this really coming from where I think it is? Or is it hiding something else in my life? And I think sometimes when we pull out those emotions in our lives and we kind of take a look at them, we put them on the table, we say, where is this coming from? And God can give us enlightenment as well about where, 
Where did this come from? Then we start moving to this place of, of health and wholeness again. You know, there are two things as we think about David and we look at his whole life and consider him and that we can see about him and his emotions. First of all, David was a man after God's own heart. Right? Like that's he's the only person in the Bible that anyone ever that was that phrase was used of. You know, nobody else is said to have been a man after God's own heart. And the second thing is he was imperfect. And some of us might say, well, how is that possible? Isn't that kind of a paradox? Like, those two don't really fit well together. And yet, to me, the way that I see it is that God loves imperfect people. He loves us even in our brokenness, even in that place where we're, we're saying, you know what, God, I don't feel like I've got anything. I feel like all these emotions are, are clouding my judgment. They're, they're suffocating me. David was a guy who committed adultery and murdered. He was still called a man after God's own heart. And God still loved him. And maybe there's one, someone here today, either here in, in the space or watching after the fact or listening after the fact that needs to hear this. That if, if you feel like your emotions are like completely out of control and you're, you're thinking to yourself, you know, how could God ever use me? Hear this now. God loves you. And God wants to heal you from feeling like you're completely out of control in that area. And that's what we see David do. We, another thing that we can learn from David is that he, yeah, he acknowledged those things, but he didn't just leave them there. He didn't say, hey, I'm going to put them on the table and then peace out, I'm gone. He said, I'm going to put them on the table. I'm going to see what I can see and make of them. And then I'm going to say, God, I need you to look at this and say, hey, what do I do with this? I mean, David admits his groaning and crying. I mean, these, these verses, like if you have any empathy in your heart, you're thinking like you just got to give him a hug after this, right? Like all night long, I flood my bed with, with weeping and I drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. I mean, that's some deep emotion that David is expressing there. But then David goes on. He says, Away from me, all you who do do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. We need to believe and trust That when we share that deeply and honestly with God about what's going on in us, that He hears us. But we don't just simply bring it uh, to Him. We do need to unpack it and say, hey, where is this coming from? What's the origin here? And then we also have to be willing to call out those emotions and fears. You know, over the last few years especially, I feel like this idea of authority and God's authority over all things has has really kind of come through for me. And realizing that sometimes we just need to name things. We need to call them out. And we need to trust that the power and authority of God is going to vanquish those things. It's going to knock them down. And so if there's an emotion that we're struggling with that we feel like it's taking over us, then call it out. Like, hey, God, take this anger. Man, I I hate to admit my weakness. But sometimes that's what God's calling us to do. He's saying, put it on the table, call it out, and say, God, my God's got authority over it. I don't. But guess what? Through his authority, I have his authority. What did Jesus say before he ascended into heaven? He said, all authority. Not some authority or, or a 10% of authority. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he extends that to us as he calls us to go into the world and make disciples. That authority that God has that's been given to Jesus is given to us as well. We have dominion over those things. Scazzaro also writes this in his book. He says, When we do not process before God the very feelings that make us human, 
such as fear or sadness or anger, we leak. Our churches are filled with leaking Christians who have not treated their emotions as a discipleship. Have you been leaked on before? I'm not talking about a little dog coming by and peeing on your leg. I'm talking about other people in your life leaking on you because they haven't dealt with the emotion that they're dealing with. Like, it's not fun. I, I can guarantee you that someone out there somewhere is saying, John leaked on me. You know, you can turn on to your neighbors and say, hey, I'm leaking, right? All of us will leak if we don't. That's the thing. Like, those of us who have been taught to just squash it down, I mean, the engineer in me is thinking about pressure buildup and stuff, right? Like, you can squash stuff down as far as you think that it will go, but it will always rear its ugly head. And eventually, it'll leak. It'll leak out. And man, I see this all the time. You know, I've had some incredibly emotional weeks as of lately, and I know that I've been leaking all over the place. And, like, this is not intended towards this person or this person or this person, but because I haven't said, hey, God, here's the, here are these emotions. Take them. Do something with them because I am powerless against them. Like, I'm going to just start leaking all over. It's an unhealthy response towards the emotions that we have. The Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 10.5, he writes this, he says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. If Jesus is Lord, then guess what? He's Lord over our emotions as well. You know, sometimes within the church, sometimes within evangelical circles, we focus so much on the salvation of God and the salvation of Jesus being about me and after I die. But how about here and now? How about salvation? How about the gospel meeting my emotions in the place where I need him the most? The gospel is for salvation, yes, saving all of us, but every single part of it. Oftentimes, we aren't comfortable enough with our emotional selves to look at them, let alone to give Jesus the freedom, the power, and the authority to take them and transform them. Do we trust that, that when we'll bring those emotions to Him, that, that He can handle them? Because we can't, and maybe you're still trying. Like, if you're still trying, God bless you. I can't. One of the things that we've said throughout this series, and I'm going to keep, until we bring this series to a close, keep saying it, is that part of having margin in our lives is admitting our own inability to do things, our own weaknesses and insufficiencies. Our capacity to do something or not do. And part of that is in our emotional life. So what do we do with this? You know, if you do read through Schizero's books at all, one of the things he talks about is that some of this place where we come to where we're not always emotionally healthy is, has been handed down to us. I'm not saying like we've all got daddy issues or mommy issues, but you know, our parents have done the best that they could given what they were given. And then we try to do a little bit better for the next generation. So one of the questions we have to have ask is, how are you taught to handle your emotions? You know, this isn't to throw shade at our parents at all, but it's just to acknowledge it. To say, hey, you know what? My parents didn't handle emotion well at all. Like, they were really bad at it. They squashed it down. Or, or they, they were like either all or nothing. And it was either like rage or it was like, in, like unfeeling. Stone. But be honest about it. You know, if, if it means having a hard conversation with your parents, hey, have at it. Second question is this. Are we giving our emotions the margin that they need? Look, like, I, I know we can go to the extremes here. I'm not saying let's go get our guitars, put a fire pit around, sing Kumbaya, and all have our lovey-dovey feelings with one another. I, that's not what I'm saying here. I'm, I'm saying just be honest with them. When, when something extreme comes out, ask where it came from. Why is it there? And what do I need to do with it? And what can God do with it? And so 
practically this week, what steps can we take towards emotional margin and health? You know, maybe it means like talking. Maybe it means like, hey, you know, for for a long time, I th- I think um I, I think we're at a place in our country where where mental health is is losing some some of the stigma that has surrounded it for a long time. I think we're in a, a better place as a country now where we can acknowledge that hey maybe there might be something going on something like depression or or other things um there's emotions there that are are running rampant and we may need to talk to someone we may be at a place where we've stuffed it down for so long that we need to say hey i need a doctor i need a psychiatrist i need somebody who can prescribe something because physiologically in my life i have squashed it down so much or i've had so much trauma in my life that i i need something that's going to help me overtake it. I believe that God uses doctors and other professionals to help us move towards a place of health and wholeness, um, and that he can do that, and that if we need to, we need to seek that out. You know, I'm not going to say, hey, everyone's going to be healed by like me putting their hand on them, and that's it. No. God gives gifts to all people, and he uses those people uh, for his glory. So how do you handle your emotions? What do you do with them? God can handle our emotions and he wants us to bring them to him. How can we live our lives with enough margin to recognize, acknowledge, and then give God our emotions, asking him to do what he needs to do in us so that they won't control us, but we won't squash them down either. Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at thebranchashland at gmail.com. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, give us a review, and share with your friends and family. Thanks for listening. See you next time.